Good morning. Welcome to another episode of Tuesday Tune. So this week we're going to continue on from what we were discussing last week uh, with geometry and handling and how those things affect uh, various aspects of your ride. Now again, this is not all specifically suspension uh, relevant, but uh, what we're going to dive into is grip front and rear, uh, particularly in corners. So those of you who watched last week will be familiar that we introduced the front center to rear center ratio. Uh, now in my opinion, this is actually about the most important number on a modern bike. I'm gonna run you through this diagram that I've made up. This diagram is a marked up photo of Paul Howard from Zep Techniques and PMBI. So he is the head of the PMBI, Professional Mountain Bike Instructor Association, uh, and Zep Techniques, which obviously is a coaching company for riders looking to improve their skills. So I've spoken to Paul about this at some length over the years, uh, and this is essentially what we've worked out. So if you're standing directly above the bottom bracket, so your center of mass was in line with this white line here, uh, you have no weight on the handlebars, you wouldn't have to have your hands on the handlebars at all, you would just balance above the bottom bracket. And at this point, your, uh, your center of mass would be, again, directly through the bottom bracket. And so the rear center and front center relationship would give us the exact weight distribution that we have. So what happens typically when people are standing, on flatter terrain anyway, they'll be in a, a fairly neutral position, as Paul's shown here. This means that their weight is slightly forward, of the center of mass by the distance of this yellow line here. The moment that that generates, so this is trying to essentially rotate you around the bottom bracket. So if you, you know, removed your hands from the bars, you would fall forward. Uh, so you support your weight with force on your hands. Now, the amount of leverage that you have over the bottom bracket is the distance from bottom bracket to handlebars, which is the spread distance that we talked about in part one of this video. If we assume that the hand force is going directly through uh, the shoulders as in Paul's case here, then you know it's more or less parallel with the fork. That means that this distance here is not truly the amount of leverage that we have uh, because the force is being applied perpendicular to this distance here. However, we're just gonna use spread here because not every rider is as tall as Paul. I think Paul is about 190 centimeters, six foot three or so. He's a particularly tall guy. So in a lot of cases, uh, the rider's arms will be a little bit more close to perpendicular to this line, especially as the bikes have gotten longer over the years. So this spread has gotten longer. So let's dig into uh, five different bikes that we're gonna look at today. So number one is this one here, the DV8 Guide. The reason that I'm discussing this one is that this is the bike that I personally currently ride. I know it very well, I'm very familiar with its handling characteristics. Number two, 2017 Transition Patrol, again, this is a bike that I've owned. Uh, I've had two of these actually, a large and an extra large. Number three, the Pole Machine. Uh, the Pole is an especially interesting bike because it has really extreme geometry, really long wheelbase, particularly slack, head angle, really long front center, fairly long rear center. I had the chance to ride one of these uh, with Leo from Pole the best part of a day during Crankworks this year. So the fourth bike that we will look at is the Nikolai uh, slash Mojo Geometron G16. The reason that we're looking at this one is because it's kind of similar to the pole. It's quite long, very slack, a very long front center. It's you know very much part of the new school, uh, longer, lower, slacker. Now the last bike we're gonna look at, interestingly, is the Nukeproof Mega. The reason for this is that this has really quite conventional geometry. It's not especially long in the wheelbase. In fact, it's shorter than every other bike that we're looking at here. I'm also looking at this bike in a size medium. This is because, unless someone can correct me, the, that is the size of frame that Sam Hill took to the EWS overall championship in 2018. As promised, here is the spreadsheet notary. So what we've got here is a chart of geometry. So we start with our static wheelbase, our rear center static, front center static. So by static, I mean at full extension. So we've got the DV8 guide here, the 2017 patrol in large and in extra large, pole machine in large, Geometron G16 in large, the Nukeproof Mega in a medium. This is not a necessarily a completely fair comparison with the Nukeproof simply because it's a different size, uh, and that is not a size that I would personally be riding. These ones here I have actually ridden. The Geometron I have not ridden, New Proof I have not ridden. Uh, so I'm going to be basing most of my comments on these four here. If we divide the uh, front center by the rear center, we get a, a number, a ratio. So in the case of the DV8 guide, it starts at 1.80. 2017 Patrol uh, in large is 1.81, in an extra large is 1.88, and conversely, if you go down the sizes, medium and small, obviously that number gets smaller. The pole machine in a large 
is 1.93, the Geometron is uh, 1.96, and the Nuke Proof Mega is 1.73. I've also gone through and calculated endo angles and looping angles uh, as we discussed in part one of this episode. So the endo angles, they rely on your center of mass being 1100 millimeters above the ground, uh, and they're basically assuming you know, that you are not moving your body position around, which obviously you actually do uh, when you're riding. So if you're riding something particularly steep, you will tend to shift your weight back to keep the load uh, as centered as possible between your tires. What we do notice, however, is that the two that are really uh, long and slack have substantially higher endo angles than, say, the DV8 uh, or the new proof for that matter. So that indicates uh, a better ability to plow through stuff without that uh, sensation of going over the bars. It also gives you some idea of the ability of the thing to ride steeper terrain uh, and you know how centered you can remain on the bike in that terrain. And so in that regard, uh, and this was my experience on the pole, on steep stuff and fast stuff, it really is excellent at just motoring through it. The looping angle. Now this is not necessarily uh, particularly accurate in the sense that it doesn't account for the seat tube angle. Now again, I've just assumed that center of mass is directly above the bottom bracket uh, and that it is at about 1100 millimeters uh, height. These assumptions are constant across all these, so at least they're reasonable for comparison, but what it doesn't take into account is the fact that the pole and the geometry in particular have really steep seat tube angle. And so in reality, these looping angles are gonna be higher again. Um, what we're seeing otherwise though is that there's only about one degree of uh, difference in looping angle. That one degree, however, when you're climbing, if that's the difference between actually being able to climb at, you know, a 21 and a 22 degree slope without looping out, that's pretty substantial. These values, as I mentioned before, are static. So that means taken at full extension of the bike, not where you're actually riding it. So what we've gone through and done then is calculate uh, what the front center of rear center ratios are at about 50% travel. Now the reason I've picked 50% travel, it's a nice round number. Cornering hard, it's entirely possible to bottom the bike out if you run a particularly soft setup. So saying that we get to 80% travel is fairly realistic if the berm is supportive enough. 50% travel is probably more like a very gently supported corner, something that's a bit better than flat, but not much. This, however, is where I think that makes the biggest difference. And so if we look at the front center, rear center uh, ratios and how they've changed, the DV8 goes from 1.8 to 1.66, 1.81 to 1.73 for the patrol in the large, 1.88 to 1.80 uh, for the patrol in the extra large, uh, 1.93 to 1.84 for the machine, 1.96 to 1.87 for the Geometron, uh, 1.73 and 1.61 for the nuke proof. Now, with the guide, this has changed more than the others simply because it has a rearwards axle path. So it means that the rear center is changing proportionally quite a bit. So we're going from 440, 457. The others are going from 430, 432 for the patrols, 455, 457-ish for the uh, machine. And again, only a couple of mil difference for the Geometron and the nuke roof. So that is why this difference is much larger. Now, if we calculate our front and rear weight biases as percentages here, uh, they all look reasonably similar. So rear weight bias, you know, we're only seeing a 2% difference from uh, the Geometron, which is the most extreme, to the guide, uh, and about, yeah, 3.6% thereabouts to uh, the new proof. So what the relevance of this is, is that we need to keep enough weight on the front tire in order to keep grip during corners, particularly flat corners. We've gone through and pulled out the reach and stack numbers for each of these bikes as well. So these are measured to the top center of the head tube. Now I've gone and then calculated the, the spread, the hypotenuse of the reach in the stack, and we've gone and adjusted that as well. So we've accounted for a 50 mil stem and 60 mil bar height. From there, we've recalculated what I call an adjusted spread. So this is the actual distance, assuming we're using a 60 mil bar height and 50 mil stem, of the distance from your bottom bracket to the center line of your handlebars, essentially. Now where you're actually gripping is obviously swept back and you know rolled and whatnot from uh, where the stem clamps the handlebar, but this is, I feel, reasonably representative. So we see, you know, from the smallest one in this field being the medium-sized nuke proof, maybe not completely uh, a valid comparison in that regard, to the machine in large, we've got literally a hundred millimeters difference, so four inches difference between these two here. We've gone through and assumed consistent rider weight here, so 80 kilograms across the board, and then what we've done is calculated 
how far forward of the bottom bracket your center of mass would have to be at 40% uh, front weight bias, 45% and 50% front weight bias. And so on the guide, keep 40% weight on the front wheel, your center of mass needs to move forward 30 millimeters, 29.5 millimeters. On the large size patrol, that was 39 millimeters, so 10 millimeters further. On the extra large, it was 51 millimeters. On the machine, 62 millimeters, which is more than double that. 66 millimeters on the Geometron, and only 19 on the new proof. And so 40% front weight bias is probably not quite enough to be keeping our weight where we need to be. I believe that the optimum weight bias lies somewhere between 45 and 50%. Without going into why I believe that to be the case, I think 50% is a reasonable upper limit. And the, simple, the simplest explanation for that is that you typically run your front tyre at a lower pressure than your rear tyre. Uh, for equal weight on both, you'll have more rubber on the ground, more grip from the front tyre. So we're going to use that as a reasonable means of comparison. 40%, 45%, and 50% front weight biases, and these distances here in millimetres uh, represent this yellow line in here. So they basically tell us how far forward this centre of mass weight force line is from the bottom bracket and how much leverage that has to try to tip you forwards. And that tells us then how much hand force we're going to have to generate based on the moment generated by your weight and how much leverage you have from your controls to your bottom bracket uh, as leverage over yourself. So what we see is that as the amount of weight that we're requiring on the front tire increases, obviously so does the distance that we have to shift our center of mass forwards. So to get 50% front weight bias, we need to have the center of mass about 150 millimeters forwards of the bottom bracket on the deviate. On the pole or the geometron, we're looking at over 190 millimeters. So that's another 40 millimeters or thereabouts uh, further forwards that we need to keep the weight. We even see the difference between the large and extra large patrol. Uh, we're seeing we're going from 157 millimeters to 172 millimeters, so about 15 millimeters of difference there in order to get 50% of your weight on the front tire for the purposes of grip. Now we go back to the new proof. Again, this is a size medium. That only requires we have our weight 135 millimeters forward of the bottom bracket to keep 50% front weight bias. When we look at that compared to the really extreme use cases, we're now 60 odd millimeters further back relative to the bottom bracket to keep 50% weight on the front tire. And so what this tends to point out is the difficulty of getting your weight far enough forwards to weight the front tire once that front center to rear center ratio gets a bit out of whack. We see in all cases uh, when we plot this out that there is more load required on your hand when that front center to rear center ratio uh, increases. Looking at you know the deviate guide here, the patrol in large, the patrol in extra large, pole machine, geometron, and the nuke proof. So we can really see that you know there is a pretty substantial increase in the amount of weight that you need to keep on your hands in order to keep enough weight on the front wheel when cornering. And this is something that I have really noticed, uh, particularly on the pole machine and on the extra large patrol that I'd previously owned. It was very difficult to keep enough weight, uh, or very tiring I should say, to keep enough weight far enough forward that you had enough weight on the front wheel for cornering. So they were great bikes at plowing through steep rough stuff, but the trade-off there was that because the front center was so long, it was just difficult to keep the weight on the front tire. If we then plot directly hand force at 50% front bias and the static and you know 50% travel front center rear center ratios, then we see like a fairly good correlation, somewhat linear, very hard to tell with so limited data points. Uh, but a, a relatively linear relationship between front center to rear center ratio, particularly at that 50% travel, but also visible somewhat at the, uh, you know, the static measurements. That shows that as that ratio gets higher, so does the amount of load required on your hands. Where this becomes particularly relevant is that that, gets, that just gets really tiring. So this is essentially why I believe that for modern bikes that generally have decent geometry, you know, sufficiently slack head angles and things like that, this front center to rear center ratio is such critical value. Now, I don't like getting super tired in my upper body when I ride. I'm not the strongest person out there and I think you know the majority of riders are probably in a similar boat. Keeping that ratio, generally speaking, on the lower side, I think the DV8, in my experience, had unbelievable front end grip. I think that is quite relevant as a choice when picking a bike. I think this also highlights something when you watch Sam Hill ride and you see how poised he is on the bikes, how centered all the time. 
You watch him hit corners and it looks like he barely moves. Uh, I think the reason for that is that he looks far less aggressive than a lot of the other riders, despite actually being faster, simply because he's not having to move his weight around as much to keep weight on that front wheel. Anyway, that is it for this week on the Tuesday Tune. I uh, hope that was something interesting. hope that will uh, spark a bit of debate. I'm sure, I'm sure that will uh, inflame some opinions somewhere, but uh, look forward to your feedback. Until next time, I'll see you then. Doo doo doo.